Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, and welcome to uh, Gotham Sound Television. This is Off Mic. I'm Nick Houston. Uh, today we have a great guest uh, for you. His name is Charles Hunt. Um, this is Charles Hunt. Hello. Uh, but before we get to Charles Hunt, we just want to say that here at Gotham Sound, we value your ideas. So if you have any ideas for things that you want to see, email us at info at gothamsound.com. You can Facebook us, you can tweet us, and you can see any and all of these videos at vimeo.com slash Gotham Sound, uh, including this one with Charles Hunt, uh, sound mixer extraordinaire. He's been around the block. Uh, was it Kids, Boom Opt, Angels in America, SVU, and now Blue Bloods. Uh, yeah, I mix kids. You're right. Oh, you mix kids. No, yeah, but you Boom Opt, Angels in America. Yes. Okay, great. I knew I was going to mess something. <laughs> so That's right. um, so how did, you, how did you get started in sound? Well, I had gone to St. Francis College mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, and I didn't know that I wanted to go into sound at all. I didn't even know that was an option. Um, but, let me see, I had become a communications major, and while I was there, there was a adjunct professor who came through, a guy named Mick Cribben, a uh -huh. uh, good friend of mine, and he has a, you know, he rents equipment and knew lots of people and had been in the business for about 20 something years. And he was doing, you know, video production. And he said, if anybody wants to work in film, like, you know, hey, you kids, you don't think it's possible. And he showed us some, 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 some footage that he had, you know, been involved in and showed us some stuff. And I thought to myself, this is great, you know, possibility of making moving art. Uh -huh. Like, I didn't even know how to describe it, but that's what it is. And he said, you know, if anybody wants to do that, you should contact us, you know, contact me. You know, he's saying that. And, you know, all the kids who are like, you know, serious Brooklyn kids are like, oh, I'm not going to man that. Oh, I'm not calling this guy. Oh, you know, this guy's <laughs> after us, something like that. I, you know, they didn't. And I did. Because I'm like, I don't have an in. I don't know anybody in the business. I don't have a, you know, relative, none of that stuff. So I just, I mean, I leaned on him two out, for two years, mm -hmm. you know. And this was like pay phones, phones at house, no cell phones, no texting, no email, no easy access to somebody. You had to like walk around with bunches of quarters and try and making that happen. It's like, you know, making, making sure that they, that they know you're serious. And two years, me just like bothering him, he turned around one day and said, hey, I got this film. You know, you want to work as a boom operator. He's like, you can boom, right? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can boom. I have no idea what a boom operator uh -huh. does. And so we did two films in succession, and then uh, we finished that. You know, and to me, it was like, okay, only working 16, 18 hours a day. That's no big deal. What's the, <laughs> what's, what's, what's the problem? Right. How hard could that be? And, uh, and then we finished shooting those, and then I turned to him like, what are we doing now? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> we're freelance. I have no idea what we're doing now. So, I mean, that was the start. Uh -huh. That was the start. And from there, um, I think I met some people at his place because I was living in Queens, and it was a long, took a long time on the train to get back home. So he was like, why don't you just stay here? He literally had a crawl space above his elevator. And uh, I stayed there and would go out on jobs and stay there and go out on jobs because it was in Manhattan. I mean, it was, you know, beautifully located where it was, so it didn't make any sense. It made less sense to him and no sense to me right. <laughs> to drag myself back to Queens. So I stayed there and um, worked and met some people, uh, met a great sound man named Bill Daly, mm -hmm. and I uh, wound up working with him on um, Five Corners, and then uh, a couple of years later, I wound up going to Africa with him. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So lots of different stuff happened because of, you know, Mick's friendship and taking me on. Because I didn't know anything about film or sound. Not a thing. <laughs> cool. Um, so tell me a little bit about some of these pictures, because we've got a bunch of pictures that you brought us. <sighs> okay. um, Pictures from of this, through some, the years. some young man. So we've got, Jerry, we've got this one if you All can right. show that a little bit closer. This is in front of some kind of lighthouse. That's, um, it's in Portland, Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a job for 
what was that for? It was for United Airlines. Uh huh. We went to. This was this was back when you know when companies had money. Um, called it industrial. So we went to Portland, Maine. Then we went to uh, Portland, Maine, Los Angeles, Tokyo, <laughs> uh, Great Britain, and then the U Germany, and then the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. And then Chicago. Um, and it was. It was a campaign um, it, that really didn't, it, it was a campaign, it was a great campaign that got me to go around the world. I mean, I got to go to Tokyo, so that was all cool, but um, yeah, got to fly all over the place. And basically, it was for business travelers, mm -hmm. because the fact of the matter is when it comes to um, airlines, business travelers prop up airlines. It's uh -huh. a fact. Right. But for some reason, uh, United Airlines wanted to have a new campaign. They wanted to just like kind of shake it all up, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. It's like you got the Ira Gershwin music, everyone knows your brand, and then they wanted something different. And it was like, sure, we'll travel all around the world selling this thing, or whatever you like. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> call us when you're finished with this one. So that was, that was just Portland, man. I don't have any other photos. Well, I'm sure there's somewhere where the rest of the place, where the rest of the job was. And so, from from planes to boats, what about this one? With you, uh, in a canoe? No, it's an actual motorboat. Uh, yeah, Lake Saranac. I think that's upstate New York. And yes, I I had to be in a boat. I mean, I I had never really thought of taking my rig apart and putting it on a boat and going that um, that portable. But yeah, that's what that was. I've had to do that on numerous occasions. And yeah. What were you recording on back then? I think I was either recording on a Portadat or a Nagra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, <laughs> cool, cool. And then what about this one? I mean, this is certainly vintage. That is, that is Mystic Pizza. Uh huh. And that is the guy with the beard is the uh, sound mixer, Russell Fager. I know that's Tim Sirstead and the AC and the script supervisor. Can't remember them all. But we were, I was trying not to bash the microphone on the beams above in some, in some restaurant in Mystic, Connecticut. And what was it like to work on that movie? And that's kind of an iconic classic. Well, that was, um, that was great. It was really great because we, we were shooting six day weeks and um, certainly with the best um, first AD I'd ever come, uh, worked with, a guy named Mark Radcliffe, uh -huh. who was like so ahead. Like the first week um, in the middle of day six, we were done. We had finished the day's work and um, so then, you know, you, you, you map things out, you board it all out, and then uh, they weren't ready to go do more. But we moved into this uh, location that was like this island where a lot of the uh, story takes place. And then we tried to take it on for about two hours, and then they realized, we have no idea what we're doing. Okay, that's it for the week. We're wrapped. <laughs> Great week, guys. <laughs> See you on Monday. But he went on to produce for Chris Columbus, Home Alone, stuff like that. I mean, never raised his voice, always ahead of stuff. Yeah, great experience. Awesome, yeah. cool. And then, um, let's see, you've got, who are these people in this picture? I'm not sure I quite <laughs> recognize them. Well, that's, um, that's my daughter, Asha. Uh -huh. My young one, Asha, that's my wife, Christina, mm -hmm. Norman. Um, that's me in a suit with my hair pulled back when I had hair. And this guy, uh, Senator, he was doing a lot of photo bombing around that time. I think that's like uh, 20, uh, 2006. He was getting in a lot of pictures. <laughs> he, just, he, was, he was everywhere. It's kind of a pain in the ass. You can't even see the picture behind us. <laughs> Very cool. And then last, uh, last but not least, uh, tell me about this. Oh, that uh, was, um, was that my first, I think it's my second trip to New Orleans. Uh, that's um, 
nomination for When the Levees Broke, uh -huh. Spike's documentary about uh, Katrina. Uh -huh. Yes. And how was it working with Spike? I had worked with Spike um, several times. I worked with Spike on Do the Right Thing. I worked with Spike on Malcolm. I worked mm -hmm. with Spike on uh, th uh, three of his documentaries, um, Jim Brown, All-American, Four Little Girls, mm -hmm. and that. And that was really quite, that was really interesting, um, going down to New Orleans. It was nine months after the hurricane had taken place, and to see what hadn't been done in that area was just kind of devastating, you just couldn't believe. Because I remember at the same time, there had been uh, a tsunami somewhere on the other side of the world. Uh -huh. And I'm pretty sure that we were like so greatly involved <laughs> in that. And it's like, do you guys not know where New Orleans is? This is not, you know, this is not a hard one. You can just get down there and help these people. And, you know, stories of people dying in the Superdome or Astrodome, I can't remember which dome it is. And, um, I mean, a lot of unbelievably bad stuff happened down there, and uh, yeah, it was really very eye-opening, yeah, pretty amazing. And then we walked the entire line of um, Zulu, uh -huh. one of the uh, social clubs, uh, front line. And I turned to Spike, and I was like, I said, what was that, like five miles? And he was like, I said, man, that was 13 miles. So we had basically, you know, when you're shooting somebody, you're walking backwards, basically. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. we, we shot the front line of that, you know, walking backwards for 13 miles. So, okay. I mean, and that was, you know, we, me, I, I got to go to Mardi Gras. That was, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so right now you're mostly doing um, episodic television, right? I am. And so tell me about that. Like, what's that like to work on a, you know? Well, I've done, uh, I've done E&G work. Hard copy and entertainment tonight. I've done documentaries, traveling around, um, which is great. Great to see the world. Cause, you know, you do you do a film, then you're in this bubble. Or you do a TV show, you're in more of a you know just as much of a bubble, meaning that you don't come in contact with the locals. I mean, you do it much more now, mm -hmm. but back in the day, it was kind of like it was like the fire department keep back 200 feet, and. Um, in your documentaries, you really get to know the area, get to you know understand the people, which is very cool. Um, but uh, you know, with, with with movies, there's more time mm -hmm. in between. It's all very concentrated, so everything that you're doing has to be spot on. So maybe you'll have numerous takes, and maybe you'll have numerous um, uh, rehearsals to get it right. Television is you have to be right and you have to be fast and you've got to be able to move and the, the, the beauty of television is that whatever it is you're thinking about that you want to work on uh -huh. you'll get lots of time to practice you get lots of opportunities to do you know similar scenes similar shots similar situations where you're outside high wind cold rain you know so you're constantly being challenged and you have to be fast. You have to be fast. You got to make the right call all day long. And these these micro adjustments that you have to make while you're while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's lots of stuff going on. You've got traffic. You've got um, you know, literally planes, trains, automobiles. You've got everything that's happening, and you have to adjust to it. I I've done a lot of stuff in cities. Like I used to do. Um, Law and Order SVU, and we did a lot of shooting outside. Mm -hmm. And what I always tried to do was try to integrate the city into the story. Literally put the city into my track. Because if not, then you're shooting in a vacuum. It's like, where are you? This place doesn't sound like anything. You know, so I always, I always found that your, your soundscape should be you know, a character in the show. And you have lots of opportunities to do that when you're doing television. Uh huh. So how would you do that? Is that something you would do live and scene, or is that in recording, uh, you know, like wild tracks? No, or? pretty much live and scene. Wow. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that's everyone has a particular technique or everything. Everything that they're going after, you know, when you start out, you have this idea of what it is you want to do, and you don't even know what it is. And then, you know, you get a little closer to it every day, month, year, you know, decade that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've always tried to do that. I, I did a show in Los Angeles and I, 
literally found that the city didn't sound like anything. I found it's very strange. <laughs> it was oh. like shooting on a back lot, um, whereas New York is a character. You know, not to put down Los Angeles. Right. I mean, I think where we were shooting, it was much more kind of, you know, I just didn't get that sense. I mean, if we were in, you know, some seriously, I mean, there's lots of grit in Los Angeles. We just weren't shooting there. So. Cool. Now, you told me that, um, you know, you went to school for communications and that your learning of sound, um, you know, wasn't, you know, the, from this technical background. How did you pick everything up and, uh, you know, and become a, you know, a sound mixer? Made lots of mistakes. Uh -huh. uh, made, you know, every mistake. I, um, now there's a lot of recording using uh, wireless. Mm -hmm. When I first got in, you used hard lines, you used wires. And um, uh, cables, or which end of a cable that you hand, is not dissimilar to plumbing or electrical stuff. Uh -huh. You know, there's male and there's female. So when your boss, uh, you know, uh, asks you to bring him a particular end of the cable, try not to bring him the wrong end of the cable. Uh -huh. Especially when it says a hundred foot run. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing you don't forget. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be told that again. Right. Or, you know, when you, when you, when you run a thing out, it's, it shouldn't be in a series of knots. Because if nothing else, you're, you're losing length every time in every knot. You know, say so you run out a 50 foot, 50 foot run of cable and you got 10 knots in there, you've lost five feet. Right. And you might need those five feet in order to make that connection. So things like that. Yeah. That I didn't understand when someone was saying, you know, send me the female end or, you know, give me this or give me that. And I was like, I didn't know what it was they were talking about. And you, you learn. It's kind of like, you know, putting your hand over a, a fire on a stove. Uh -huh. It's like, bad idea. Probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Yeah. And who are the guys that you learned from? Who are your mentors? Uh, my mentors, um, a great sound man named uh, Bill Daly. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of um, action stuff. He, I think he got very close. I believe there's a story where he got extremely close to creating um, time code. But I'm pretty sure he may have gotten um, something happened. He may have gotten snatched up by the Hells Angels uh, in the middle of it. So, it's a much longer story. I'm pretty sure it's been documented. Okay. Yeah, but it's a true wow. story. Okay. Um, and he did a lot of stuff with Jackie Chan, did The Protector. Mm -hmm. um, I think he did some sound on JFK. I think he did a movie called Heaven, Heaven and Earth with, uh, with um, uh, Oliver Stone. Um, he had done Five Corners. You know, really a, a very, very brilliant sound man. Um, so him, and I'd say Jimmy Sabat. Now, I had known of him for years, and uh, Jimmy's, a, Jimmy's a real funny guy. He's the kind of guy who, like, doesn't know you, will call you, and basically the conversation is, uh, Hi, so, uh, Charles, it's Jimmy. Hi. Uh, that's Jimmy Sabat. Okay. Um, so listen, I'm starting this show in a couple of weeks, and um, you know we're going to be shooting at Silver Cup, and I'm like, hi Jimmy, how's it how's it going? Uh, what are we talking about? Right. Okay. So um, so I probably have like a, a six o'clock uh, load in or something like that. All right. So so you're good for that, right? I'm like, oh, sounds sounds great, Jimmy. Okay, I'll, I'll see you then. And that was pretty much my first conversation with him while I was at the Museum of Natural History with my family having never spoken to him in life. Hmm. You know, I think his feeling is, I'll just call you, hire you, and then tell me, you know, have you tell me that you can't do it. <laughs> it worked, you know. And uh, we did this uh, TV show called Big Apple um, that had a great cast. It was um, David Milch. Mm -hmm. Crazy little show that um, I don't know, I don't think, I don't think that we could, figure it all out exactly and it, it it only went for like 10 episodes and then the next thing that we did was angels in america but at that point i was already mixing doing a lot of commercials and but i mean you know the 
greatest cast of all time. Yeah, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, Al Pacino, um, I think Emma Thompson, uh, um, the woman who was in Weeds, I can't remember, you know, directed by Mike Nichols, Meryl Streep was in it. Yeah, I mean, it was just a monster of a show. It was some of the, just, it was, it was great in that it was like, this is the way it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. Of, he would work the actors out and then he would go away, leave it to the DP, and then we'd work everything out and we would, you know, exhaust second team. Because when he came back, it's like, it's gotta be ready. It's gotta be ready, he doesn't wanna hear about it. And then we would do it and we'd just knock it out. It's just over and over and over again. And if anyone remembers, it won everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like every, like Jimmy won an Emmy. I mean, like every category, <laughs> it won everything. So it's like, oh, okay. You can do great stuff on television. It's possible to do it. It just, you have to do it the right way, as opposed to, you know, throwing everything up on the wall and seeing with sticks. Like, oh, I like that. <laughs> like, it's just sticky. Yeah, yeah, it's there. <laughs> Um, so tell me a little bit about, we've got some pictures of your cart uh, oh, and your kit. Okay. So tell me a little bit about, about your kit and how you, um, you know, decided to put that together. Well, let's see. Um, well, my cart has definitely been evolving over the years. I, it's like, once again, I made some mistakes and I finally uh -huh. got it right. There's uh, this, uh, this uh, square uh, metal tubing, uh, aluminum tubing, uh -huh. 8020. And I had heard about 8020 and I wanted to use it and then it's like, they called it a, what is it, like a, like a, a rector set for adults or something like that. Uh -huh. And so you can configure these things in any way that you want to. But it's, it's, it's right up there with uh, the old um, uh, frequency agile uh, electros, uh -huh. you know. You have 256 channels to choose from. I don't want to. Why would I want to do that? <laughs> right. You know, I'm going to get some that are set and then I'm going to live with them. If not, then I got to crawl around the back of it and do it all over again. It's much better now coming out of the venue where it really is frequency agile and then you can just like kind of fly right through it and find whatever it is you need. But, um, um, right, so what I had done was I made one which I thought would have like, you know, the, the right amount of draws. And it was made out of like uh, the, um, the square rail that's about an inch and a half wide on the bottom. And then I had a top that had all the brains. So the top was thinner than the bottom, but the, so the, the, the top of it sat um, on top of it, mm -hmm. uh, on top of the bottom. And it was so wide that I, I think I, I got into about half of the elevators that I needed to while I was doing a show. So the next season, I had to try and find a way to literally cut it down to size. Um, I eventually would take the bottom of the cart apart mm -hmm. and then um, literally take a hacksaw to it <laughs> to, to skinny it up, to skinny up the bottom of the cart so I could actually get into more than half of the elevators or houses that I needed to get into in order to do the show. If not, I had to stay outside and just run cable everywhere. Um, so from that evolution, I mean, you know, I, I got to the point where it's like I wanted all the stuff that I needed on the bottom and all the brains that I needed to work at and see on the top. And then the next part was when I was on the West Coast and not working after this show I'd done Law and Order Los Angeles got canceled, um, I had to do day work. And the original cart is not at all set for day work. So I couldn't move it into my truck. I couldn't get it. I had to like, you know, use a trailer to, uh, to move it around. So what I did, I went to backstage mm -hmm. and I had them make basically a sleeve so that the top of the cart could sit into it. So um, yeah, that was a lot of sweat equity. So basically bringing the cart over to the truck, lifting the top of it off, sliding it in, and then rolling the bottom of it in. So that's the way it's designed now, which is really great because it's, um, it's about 28 inches wide now uh -huh. as opposed to like 35. And so tell me a little bit, this is the, the top part oh. of your cart. This is the oh, brains. What do, you, what do you got on here? Well, there's a power supply on top, the Meon Life. Uh -huh. And then there are two venues. And then there is a 
switch, patch bay? Yeah, patch bay. And what's going into that patch bay and where does it go from there? Patch, the, um, everything coming out of the venue is going into the patch bay. Uh -huh. And then coming out of the patch bay going into the mixing board. So do you ever, um, what do you use the, the patch bay for? So that I can um, put the speakers in sequential order. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's pretty much always boom all the way to the left, and then whoever talks next, 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 like that. And, and then, those are just a bunch of names. They don't mean anything. And then this is your mixer, right? This is that is my mixer, the uh, the Cooper Two Hundred Eight. Mm hmm which I wish they were making more of or someone had picked up the patent or kept it going because it's a really lovely mixer. I have uh, the, two, uh, the 106 plus one as well. Love these mixers. And then what are you recording to? I'm recording to um, 970 is my backup and the 788 is uh, my, my, uh, my hero. And then there's, we have one more picture. What is the, um, there's a, like a little tablet mounted onto the side of your cart. Um, what is that called? Movie Slate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, basically for, um, that's just for my notes. It doesn't, it doesn't control the cart, the um, mixer. Uh, it doesn't control the 788 or any, either of the recording devices. It's just so that I can not have to deal with paperwork. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right, so no paper. No paper, and that's, everyone on there is on uh, part of the uh, workflow, and uh -huh. then once I'm done, I check the sound reports that I've been putting in, so, you know, I can take, take names in and off, uh, in and out, uh, when I'm, you know, once I'm done recording. Like, you know, they're in this scene, they're not in this scene, or let's change it over, and, um, and then I send it off. And when, um, when you were building your kit, you mentioned to me that, uh, you had this philosophy about building from the outside in, like not starting with the recorder, starting with other things. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, it's just that the recording device is pre pretty much a you know, high ticket item and you don't necessarily need it, mostly because it could change over and it's going to be the most accessible thing there is. All the stuff that is idiosyncratic to you, you know, I have to have this, I have to have that, I can't do the job without this. Those are the things you need to have. The recording device is going to change. I mean, you know, I think I have, I think I have my Naga for sentimental reasons. I should sell the damn thing. But, you know, I always liked it. Got me out of trouble. Got me in another trouble. But, um, you know, I've had a Nagra, Portadat, uh, 824, and we're just not using them anymore. So it's kind of pointless to, I have to build my whole cart around this thing, or I can't get anything until I get that. And it's like, no, 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 you can probably get a whole lot of stuff. And then, you know, then you rent that thing that is the most accessible. Mm -hmm. Because the medium continues to change. I mean, there are people running around doing this on computers. Yeah? I mean, I'm not. Maybe I should be. I don't know. But, um, like that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't believe that you need to build, you know, oh, it's not there. But, um, you know, you need a comm tech. You need to be able to transmit stuff. There's a lot of stuff that you can do before you get that. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that could be a rental item. Right. And yeah, you, and how long is that, that comm tech transmitter or that Cooper board, like how many recorders has that been through? That's probably been through quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of some. <laughs> Four. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And um, you also told me, so you told us about your, this cart, but tell me a little bit about your first cart. We don't have any pictures of that, but I oh, think that's a great story. Right. Well, the first cart that I had was a, um, a PSC cart, a metal cart, and the, 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 the problem that mixers have is we put too much stuff in our carts, and that's why I have an 820. I mean, an 8020. So the, I, I don't know, I guess it would hit a bump I hit too many bumps and all of a sudden the bottom of it would bow and then the thing would be off. So then I went from there to a, uh, an Odyssey um, road case. And I was working a lot, doing a lot of commercials and um, I didn't really feel like doing it the right way. Uh -huh. <laughs> building it the right way, building it out the right way. So and I was going through wood so I'm like, oh, that's all I need. 
drywood, uh, drywall screws. So I'll just go through the wood with a drywall screw. You know, I should have cut the drywall screw on the inside of the card. I should have filed it down. There's a lot of things I should have done. Because when you, when you buy something, when you get something, when you make something, you have to always think that I'm going to have to repair this from time to time or make an adjustment. So when I make an adjustment, you know, I don't want to reach in and come back with a bloody stump, which is what I did. Uh, because I just didn't spend the time trying to get it right. Whereas now, you know, there's a door in the back of the cart and there, there won't be any, you know, there'll be no damage when I uh, try to fix something or make an adjustment in the back. Right. But that, that's, that's, that's evolution. These things take time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so any advice for, like, uh, you know, young mixers that, <clears throat> you know, their ideas... Go on the camera. No. Oh, uh, yeah. No. <laughs> 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 All right, so besides get out while you still can, uh, which was actually the first advice I ever got. There you go. Um, for somebody that, that really knows that, that's, that this is what they want to do, anything um, that you have for them that... Uh... It's, it's, it's fun. Follow... I don't know. I, can only, I mean, everyone can only speak for themselves. You know, you'll take someone under your wing because they remind you of you. That's why you would do it nine times out of ten, unless you're a masochist. Um, but, you know, follow your muse. Follow what it is that you're trying to accomplish. It will take a while for you to get to that point, and it's something you can always go after. But, you know, odds are you don't have the wrong idea. So, um, it's fun. I mean, it's really fun. Um, I mean, you can make this as hard as you want to. And I've seen it done. And I've seen guys, you know, go a little crazy doing this stuff. But over time, I realize this is not impossible to do. I mean, I enjoy it. I enjoy it a great deal. Cool. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, well, Charles, thank you so much for, for coming in. We're done. That's we did it. Uh -oh. uh, Charles Hunt, ladies and gentlemen, thank hey. you very much. Um, so. What are we doing? Oh, yeah. So next week, yeah, we, we do this thing next week. Um, next week, Tuesday, February 9th, we will have the RF Venue Optics RF Over Fiber with Alex from RF Venue. Uh, people are actually invited to come here into our studios or maybe outside the studios and then uh, talk to Alex, touch the, uh, the Optics RF Over Fiber um, in the studio. This video and more are available at vimeo.com slash gotham sound you can facebook us you can twitter us uh, and you can always email us your ideas at info at gotham uh, thank you very much and see you next week